what's going on with the internet. <laughs> anyway, um, my name is Samantha Mirabal. I'm with Melco's application team, and this is our design shop talk where we're trying to get, you know, any questions you might have um, so you can be more efficient, use the tools better, and really just enjoy, you know, embroidery so you not know how to use it better. All right. So I do have a lot of questions that were sent in. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there. I will scan through the comments from when it was live to see if any were typed in by chance. But we'll come back to that. So one question was, what's the difference between density and pull compensation? So it's kind of two different effects you have going there. So density is kind of, cover, think of it as coverage. That's how I always do, is um, if you're painting a wall, how how much paint you have on the brush, right? So in our instance, how many how much thread are you laying down? The denser it is, that's the more stitches, the more needle penetrations, the closer your stitches are going to be together. Um, the higher it is, your density number, the more spread out it's going to be. So if I take a column, and I'm just going to draw that so I can show it to you in real time. And let's make this a wider column and zoom in on it. All right, so density is literally the distance between this stitch and that stitch. So if I met, grab my measuring tool and I measure it, that's four points, okay? So that's the density I have across here. So if I change this to properties, I'm going to go turn off the auto density so you can see it. So if this is set to four, that's the density currently. If I sew it out and I say, well, I don't like what I'm seeing. I don't have enough thread. It's I see too much fabric between it. If those are the sorts of things you're thinking, you're seeing, what you're going to want to do is possibly move those closer together, right? So in that case, I'm going to overdo it to show you the effect. So if I change this to two, you'll notice now I have double the number of stitches. Um, and again, if I measure from stitch to stitch, you can see that's roughly two points across, right? So that it's pushing them closer together, more needle penetrations, more stip, more sewing. Now, on the other hand, if you're sewing something out and you think to yourself, man, I'm hammering this. I really don't need it that tight. I don't need that many stitches in there. I need to lighten it up some. Well, what do you do? You'd increase it. And again, I'm going to over, overdo it so you can see the effect easily. If I change that density to eight, again, well, now it's more of a zigzag. All right, so it's spreading the stitches out more. So I've got eight points between stitches, and it's a lighter, less coverage, less needle penetrations. Now, pull compensation is related in a way. It's more related to how you're sewing, right? So if I make, if I do a needle penetration here, so I, I'm going to the machine, I sew, it's going to put a hole in my fabric, and now the machine's going to move at a high speed over here and make a needle penetration to go collect a bobbin and to make your stitch, right? So as that thread's machine's moving over here, what's happening to the thread that's moving through that hole? Well, that hole is trying to move this way. Well, same thing what happens here. It's going to go make a needle penetration. It's going to try to move that way. So what's happening is it's pulling in, right? So those the columns are, in effect, trying to narrow up. It's just part of how embroidery is done. So as it's narrowing, that's what's known as pull. Well, what happens to the fabric and everything as it shrinks in, it's going to stretch out. That's push. So when you hear people talk about push-pull, that's what you're looking at. The push effect of everything wanting to grow this way and the pull effect of things shrinking in. Okay, So it's common to see columns shrink. I mean, you can see them shrink up to 10%. Now, you can, of course, mitigate that using good stabilizers, making sure you have appropriate underlay and things like that. But then we know it's going to shrink some, so what do we do about it? Well, that's where you come into pull compensation. So pull compensation you can do by percent or by offset. Um, I like using offset personally. I don't use percent ever. Um, I'll show you why in a moment. But So all that's doing is when I say a pull offset of two, it's going to, from your original wireframe, it's going to overstitch. So rather than making the needle penetration right on the wireframe, it's out a little bit further, two points. One to three is plenty. If you find yourself wanting to do really big numbers, I would suggest redigitizing it to make the item larger because it just gets excessive, particularly when you go around corners. It doesn't look clean anymore. So one to three, um, one or two points is usually plenty for most things you're going to want to do. And I said the percent-based one I don't use a lot, and this is why. So if I take a shape and I draw it, give it a start and a stop, and a stitch direction. 
Now, if I come into here, you see that's a triangle, right? So, oops, let me change the stitch direction like that. All right, so let's say I'm now going to go into pull compensation and make it 150%. Eh, it no longer looks like a triangle anymore, does it? It's now something else. Because what's happening there is it's looking at the stitch length and it's doing multiplication, right? So for in the direction of that it's sewing, which is this dotted line here, this distance, it's doing 50% over stitching, right? So it's going past your border by 50%. Well, when you have a really short distance up here, it's only going to overstitch a little. By the time you get down here, I've got a really large distance, so it overstitches a lot in those regions. So that's why you see these sorts of effects. Um, that's why I personally stay with offset uh, percent. You can limit it. There's other ways you can do it. So if you really like pull by percent, you can say, okay, max of three and then it will truncate all that for you. So there are ways around that weird effect, but personally, I just leave it alone and stay with pull offset. It's a personal preference. You do you. It works well. All right. So let's see, what else do we have? Um, how can you determine what's too much density and what would be ideal for a column as far as the numbers go? Uh, there's no magic answer, unfortunately. It really, you have to sew it out. Um, there's so much things that can go into that. It can be, you know, the um, underlay, your, oh, what else is there? You know, what type of stabilizer you're using, what materials you're using, are you using topper or not? One thing I would suggest is before you go straight to cranking down on density, uh, consider layers, all right? So what I mean by that is if you see, you're seeing too many gaps in your fabric, well, look at your underlay. Maybe you do a zigzag underlay and then a satin over top and that helps it. Um, maybe if you're just wanting the edges to be crisper and ed an edge walk around there before you go and do your top stitching will work. So before you go straight to going, hey, 3.7 isn't good, I'm going to go down to 3. Okay, well that might, that'll give you a whole bunch of needle penetrations. It'll add more thread, you know, paint, more painting down on your fabric, but you could have done that maybe with fewer stitches with a changing your underlayer up or even using a topper. So before you go straight to uh, cranking down density, look at those other things. All right. So we had a question that was, I've done a couple, couple of company logos where I used Adobe to convert the logo to a vector. I convert it over into stitches. And when I sew it out, eh, it doesn't look so great. What do I do about it? All right. So what I did is just as prep work. I grabbed a design that you guys all have. It's under your, if you go to C, designs, graphics, down in here somewhere is, yeah, that get involved. So I took that bitmap. I brought it into Illustrator. I did a quick conversion, um, which isn't the best idea, but that's what I did and expanded the stitches. I copied that and I pasted it into Design Shop. So now I'm going to go open the file that I got. Hmm. Oh. All right. I guess I'll copy and paste it again. New. Paste. Copy. Paste. All right. So I've got my vectors in here. So you could take that, convert to stitches. Poof. I have it. Now, is this the best stitch out? Probably not. Well, I'm looking at it. There's things I just don't like about it personally. So if you, what you would want, what I always look at the auto conversion as, it's really, it's highly dependent on having very good art. So if your art's great, it, it'll convert great. But most of the time it'll convert kind of okay, but then you have to tweak it. So let's look at a few things. Like, what do you do about it? Well, zoom in and think about it and work the areas that you don't like. So like here, this weird twist that it's got going, First off, I'm going to delete these strange stitches. And a trick, if you're not aware of it, is an end line. So these are stitch direction lines, right? That's left click and drag. So that will give you the different stitch directions. So you can clean that up just by rotating them around. But what if you want to deal with that push effect that we were talking about? Well, I can right click and drag outside of that. And you'll see it put this red line on there. That's an end line. So I can drag that down if I know about how much I need to compensate for that push effect and be done with it, right? So see how it's not 
adding stitches up here anymore. So that's an easy way you can quickly deal with push. All right. So we've got our, that's an end line. That's a right click and drag. So again, down here, I can right click and drag, and then I can move this. And you see how it's moving all the stitches. So that's, again, just an easy way you can deal with push. All right. So the other thing you can do is, let's say I come over to this end and I go, eh, I don't like it. How it's sweeping these stitches around here. I'd rather add a splice or change the splices. Right here, this green line, that's a splice line it put in. So I can select that green point and delete it and see everything goes haywire because my stitch directions don't fret. Here, while it's still selected, I'm going to go insert splice line, left click and drag. And that does a little bit better. Let me maybe put another one here. And now we're going to play stitch, to line, stitch direction cleanup. So maybe I want that. Eh, I don't like that. Let's do there. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll add an end line here and here. And this rotation is weird. So let's move that stitch direction. So you can see all I'm doing is playing with the stitch directions and lines until it looks better, right? And what looks better to me might might not be quite right, or maybe you just want to look at it and play with it. So really, when you're dealing with those auto conversions, it's a, going to be a matter... Oh, I don't like that at all. I don't, but anyway, you'd want to play with it until you get it to look how you want it to look, right? So like this E has a weird splice. I would go get rid of that and add ones. The D is straight fill. Maybe I'd want it to... Um, maybe add a splice line around here so I can get more satin stitches, things like that. All right. So really when you're dealing with those auto conversions, it's a matter of looking at what you got and working with it and changing it up. Right. So I only have one stitch direction on this. Oops. I didn't want that. Let's say rather than having that ver that horizontal stitch direction, I want to change it this way, and maybe I want to add some others, right, to give it some motion. So you can do all these sorts of things just by playing with it, or maybe you want to add a pattern to that. And I can go into my pattern fills and make it look different, right? So it's just working with what you have until you like how it's going to look, making sure you have good underlay, that the connectors are all working out right, and things like that. Okay. All right. What else? Let's see. That one. How can I adjust underlay and density on pre-made shapes, non-fat satin filled sorts of things? Okay. So pre-made shapes are down here. So mm, there. So I don't know. Oh, these aren't shapes. These are designs. Where are the shapes? Closed shapes. All right. So if I've got this guy here. Okay, so I just selected it, clicked and dragged onto the screen. And then to change its underlay, you're gonna come, you just double click on the shape, go to underlay, and you can edit it here. So let's say you want a center walk and a zigzag for this particular one. Okay, well you can do it that way. Or if you wanna use auto, you can turn on auto. Um, so you can adjust any of them by playing with these and it will change it up for you. So this one did an edge walk as when it was on auto. Okay, so it's as simple as that. Selecting your shape, right click, go to properties, or you double click on the shape. So if I select the shape and double click it, now I'm in the properties of that. And on the underlay tab is where you adjust it. Your primary underlay says first, your secondary underlay says second. All right, what else do we have? Um, Quick reminder on editing and deleting lettering after it's in place in Design Shop. How do we do it? All right, so lettering is, I'm going to do a new document. Click the A for lettering. If you know up front what font you want to use, the size, all the different connect, connection types and all that, you can type them in. You can put them up there before you start typing. Left click and check. If you want to adjust the text now, let's say you have a spelling error and you meant to write test. I can double click on it in this box under letterings. I would change it. Okay, so there's one. Now, if you need multiple lines, you can do that. You wanna rotate it. There's a 
several ways you can. Select the element, left click on it, and you'll notice just by left clicking on it one at a time, those boxes are changing colors. That's a scale mode, so that lets me scale, move it around um, to change the size, stretch it out, things like that. If I left click on it again, I get this, these hollow boxes, which is a rotation mode. So I can rotate it around and it, if you look down here while I'm doing it, it'll show you what it's rotating. I'm sorry, it's right there, right under this. So if you look down there, I've got 20, negative 27 degrees or 59 degrees, you know, whatever. So if you want a specific angle, the other ways on this W and H, it doesn't matter which. If you left click on it, it'll bring up this box and you can tell it exactly what angle you want to rotate it at. So say you want two degrees, okay, whatever it might be. Um, you want to delete it. So let's say you have more, more tests more text. You don't want that one anymore. Just select it. And when you select it, you can do it on the screen. You can do it over here. So just left click, hit your delete key, and it's gone. If you want to delete one particular letter, you can also click on that black X and hit delete, and it'll delete them for you. Hey, that's cute. So three different words there. <laughs> All right. What else did we have about text? There's quite a few. Um, oh, I added some text and I don't know how to arc it. What do I do? All right, so that's your baseline effects. So test. Right down here is your line type. So I can change it to arc and now it's arched. So with that, you can drag it around manually. If you know the radius you want, you can type it in and the angle this is, if it's at zero, notice I have text right here. Well, I can also change it to counterclockwise, but that's upside down, right? Well, if you don't want it upside down, I can change the angle to 180, and that's how I can get a lower arch. So I can get, a, you know, the bottom of a, t a patch, for instance. Okay. So that's how you would add an arch. There are a lot of other ones that are fun. Um, there was another question about making, um, how do you make text stay the same size? So let's say you've got a three inch by one inch space that you're trying to keep everything fit, fit in. So if I draw, oops, let's not do it that way. Let's do this one there. So if I make a box three inches by one inch, so let's say that's the space I have for text. What I can do is change this so my, it's in an envelope form and that line up top and bottom kind of block the space out. So what's that good for? Well now, if I want to change that, it stays fitting within that region and it will automatically stretch it or sh st stretch it out, shrink it up to make it stay. So let's say you're changing a bunch of names and you, or numbers or something that you always want to stay in the exact same place, just fill up that area. Well. you can do that. It'll keep stretching them out and making it fit. Now what's also fun about envelope is you can add points to it. So if I add that, I can make it stretch to different shapes. So if you're trying to fill a, a bear for, you know, mama bear or something like that, um, you can draw that out and make your top and bottom lines fit whatever shape it is. And then when you type in your text, it'll stretch out to fit there. Okay, so that's that one. Um, Two-day training on a new machine is coming up. What do you have? To, what do you want to ask? Well, one of the best advice I can always tell everyone is make sure you have sample things that you want to do. So if your business is going to be sewing on webbing or sewing on um, t-shirts. Let's say you're doing those cute little shirts that for kids, you're gonna have a number in their name or something like that um, to do applique work. Have different materials there so that you can practice with your trainer and get tips on working with your materials there. Um, the, if you can play around ahead of time with your machine, sew out, keep a notebook near your machine and every time you don't know something, write it down. That way, if you figure it out later, great. If not, you can ask your trainer, you can ask on these Q&As, 
or on these design shop talks and get your questions answered. Um, so learning about ActiveFeed, laser alignment is a great thing to have them demo and for you to practice while there. It helps you kind of get rid of the intimidating hooping factor that some people seem to get overwhelmed with how to hoop things. Um, I don't know. Well, I think of others, but I mean, the biggest thing I could say is have materials there, lots of things to practice. If you have specific logos that you want to try, send them out, get them digitized by a quality digitizer so they're there. You're not going to have a lot of time there to play with how to digitize. It's more how to run your equipment and how to do it well, because all the things that you need hands-on to really understand in digitizing, we can do on the computer, right? So send it out, have it ready, so you can just get right to tr learning how to recognize things um, and how to troubleshoot thread breaks. So those are really simple. The trainer should cover all that for you, but it's all a good place to start. Um, another question we had was, where's a good place for a new person who wants to learn how to digitize? Where do I go? All right, well, let's look at that. Um, come here. There. All right. So let's start off with learning how to digitize MelcoUniversity.com. Go to media. And these are also all on YouTube. I just like the media tab because it's all organized. What I would always tell folks is start at the top and work your way down. All right. So this, these first four categories are working with design shop, working with designs that are already created for the most part. Lettering is kind of an exception there. But literally just click that, watch each video, go through them all. Let And what's nice about these is they're little bite-sized portions. So if you want to just go readdress what the different connection types are, you can go watch that. Or if you can't remember how to do special characters, hey, there's a video on that. Um, or let's say you just want to go learn more about density or pull compensation. You can re-watch those. So these first four work with designs that are always there, but start at the top, work your way down. Once you kind of have those understood, now let's go into creating your own. Um, and one thing you'll know is it's, it's a learning process. You know, you can learn how to click the tools pretty quick. So I can show you, click, click, click. Hey, we created some stuff. But it then comes down to sewing it out and learning from it. it every sew out to learning opportunity, right? So let's start at the top here. Once you get through these videos uh, right here, you have all the tools necessary. Now it's really down to practicing and thinking about it. Looking, you know, I always look at digitizing like a puzzle that you're going to put together. How can I minimize the trims? So go from point A to point B, you know, to create it. Build it from the bottom to the top and be most efficient with my pathing so that I can minimize my trims. What is that good for? Well, that he helps you have a faster sew out. Why does that matter? So some people will say, hey, does it really matter if I save a minute in sewing time? Well, by, you know, pathing stuff out a little bit better. If you're sewing one, I guess it's a minute, so that can be argued as negligible. But let's say that's going to go into a production piece that you're going to do um, 500 shirts, 1,000 shirts. Well, that's by taking the time to plan out your path and think about it, you've managed to take one minute out of a thousand sew outs. That's real time and money that's being saved to them, right? That's hours of work just by spending that time to think about the digitizing ahead of time. So it's an excellent thing for you to pay attention to um, when you're getting start, when you learn are learning how to digitize, to digitize cleanly from the start. That way it's, you know, when you're only doing one thing at a time, it kind of doesn't matter. But the goal is to grow, right, for most folks. Um, so when you grow, it's a little more obnoxious to have to go back and relearn how to do that. So thinking about those things up front and setting up those good habits as you're learning from the beginning um, really helps. Okay, so that's a good place to start. Another would be to go to the Melka service site, so melka-service.com and click on this FAQ. So the FAQ will take you to the section there. This is packed full of resources, okay? So let's say you wanna learn how to, you have a specific thing in mind you're trying to learn about, how to digitize Puff. Well, 
there's lots of details on Puff. Um, you can go find videos. There's links to videos in here. There's documents that you can read. Um, there's all kinds of information that is added to on a regular basis. So keep that in mind. Um, that And then, of course, these Facebook Lives, um, we have them on a weekly basis. There's usually one on Mondays. I don't know. They're all over. There's Wednesday for embroidery, and then we have the Design Shop Talk. And they're going to be adding them as we go forward. So just keep those, keep watching them, and ask your questions. If you have ideas of stuff you want to talk about, get them on the list. Okay. Um, order of digitizing lo logo and direction of sew out. That depends from logo to logo. Okay. Ha it. You really have to think about it, and I always think of them, like I said, as puzzles. How can I most efficiently get through this design to work from back to front so that it's layered up, but minimizing my number of color changes to only ones I have to have for to get the look I'm going for, and to minimize my trims. So if I'm going, if I've got a big outline of a whole lot of stuff, it's all black and it's all touching, well, then I'm going to have to think about my starts and stops of how I can get around the entire thing without having to do trims. So it, that comes with practice. There is really no formula. It's planning it out, thinking about it. Um, a good trick I always use for things that are connected is you can print them out and put a pencil down and try to trace around it without lifting up your pencil. That is going to be the path that you want to digitize in. If you lift up your pencil, that's going to be a trim. All right. Uh, I purchased a font off of Etsy. Etsy. How do I download it into DS? Well, here, I'm going to go new. Depends on what type of font. If it was an OFA, that's simple. You go copy it over into. So if you bought an O, oh, ooh, this is fun. If you, goodness, my, I have a presentation up, so it doesn't like that. Let me go close the presentation because it's freaking out my graphics card. How do I do that? And slideshow. There we go. All right. Um, if you have an OFA file, you would go to C, program file, wherever you have Design Shop installed. So I have it under x86 Melco Design Shop, which, wherever you have it. And under alphabets, you would paste them here. Okay. And these are the OFA files. This allows it to be things that you can type in. All right. Now, let's say you don't have an OFA file. You've got a whole bunch of DSTs. That's where it's a little less fun. So I dropped some in here of ones that I had bought. Not the whole alphabet. But what you would do is one at a time insert them. So I would go insert, go find the letter I want, and let's say I want that A. And then I go insert my B, etc move them around and position them where you like you want them it's slow work but that's how you use them all right remember you do have these tools that can help particularly with spacing so if I come over and let's say I enter let me put a few more in see now if I select them all all three of them I can then use this here to evenly space them right so that'll evenly space them out so that those are little tricks you can use to kind of help yourself, you know, center them, evenly space them. There. This will, so it'll space them out so that they're as close or as far apart as possible from one another within the spacing you've given it. Okay. So it's just bringing them in one at a time. All right. Now, we had another question about the alphabet editor and how we can, um, where's the question? Let's see. Or before I jump ahead, let's see what else we have. Oh, this one. Let's do it. It's coming up, so I'm just, I'm not going to jump ahead. I'll, we'll get there in a second. Um, these are all satin stitches, and I want to split them. How do I do it? So I drew up a few things just to show you. So I think this is what you're wanting to do. I think you're saying, I have this, but I want something more like that. I want to put a split line down the middle. How do I do it? S several ways you can do it. To add a split down this, I can go into the properties 
and I can change it to an auto split. And let's make that there. So I made the partitions for zero. It adds a split down the middle. So that's one way you can do it. Another way you can do it is you can control where that split is. So if I take this guy here, and if you hold this down, you'll see there's this insert split line. So I can left click, right click, click around, and add a split line. Oops, hit escape. There we go. So now I have a split line. Um, and again, to do that, insert split line, click and add it wherever you want it. There, now I have a split line. Hit escape, get out of that tool. All right, so you can add additional splits that way. All right, so you can either go mess with your partitions and your partition sequence. You could also do like a 101. That's another one. It'll kind of blur the outline a little bit. So if you want it to not quite as um, hard of a line, but you still want that look, you can try that. So there's one. What else do we have? Other questions. So that's how you would add splits to create this kind of look. You either use as partitions, add a split line, or um, you can also do that as a fill. So if you convert it over to fill, you can add a split line as well. So it works I, any of those ways. Other questions. Of course, in my haste to close everything, I closed all my things, including my questions. Okay. So that was this one. All right. How would I go about setting up lettering designs for different fabrics and saving them for use on future orders? Well, you create yourself a template file. So what I mean by that is you would come over here and set it up however you want it, right? So let's say you want a scripty font, athletic script maybe, and you want it to have auto density, maybe you don't want auto density, maybe you want a fixed density, and maybe you want an underlay, not auto, you want to specify it. I'm going to just say auto. Okay, so let's say that's what you want. Well, you would save this file, save as, template, and next time you want to use it, you'd open it up, type whatever you want, and the properties that you set up would hold. Another way you can do it is not file dependent, it's by creating a style. So I can come over I can go into my properties and say create style, give it a name, okay? And then over here, I can go set up all the properties I like for my underlay, for how my stitching is going to look, what sort of pull compensation I want, um, and all of those sorts of things. So I can set that up here and save it so that now, next time I want to use it, I can go select this whatever text in any document. And I can say apply that to this selection. And whatever you set up in that test template fi um, style will apply to this. So those styles are available anywhere. So if you open a new file and I say style properties, I didn't set a font, but I can come over here and apply. And that will change all my underlays, all my things to whatever was in that. So if you want to do it for different, like here, there's one for heavyweight knits, that's one. There's another that's pre-selected. So you can go look at what those are, change them to suit your, your needs if those work, or you can create your own. All right. So there's that. What else do we have? Um, when you save a lettering design, do you want to start a new one? Do the def And you want to start a new one. Do you, the defaults go back? or does it remember the last DS settings? It depends. If you're working within this file, whatever the defaults for this file are is what's going to be there. Um, so however that, actually not for that file, whatever is set up for this element is what it's going to use. When you go create a new el text element, that's going to use the software defaults. Now let's say you want to change your software defaults. How you would do that is I like to start from a new file, that way you know what they are. Right click on the lettering, and over here you can change. So let's say you don't want auto. Eh, I like auto, but let, you can change whatever you want over here. So let's say the 64, you want it to be 20. Okay, so whatever, or 32, let's say 32. Okay, so let's say you change all these to whatever you want. 
you add, maybe you want a point of pull offset, you want auto underlay, auto density, let's say that's what you want. Then right here, you can click on save current settings to defaults, and you can save for permanently or only for this document. All right, so you can adjust that. If you want that to be your permanent setting, you would just say save to defaults permanently. Voila, you're done, okay? So it really depends on how you have your default set up. They, they're persistent to the file. When you start a new file, it goes to the DS default. Okay, what else do we have? There. We deleted the lettering in the other, um, I think we did. If you want to delete lettering, you would type in your text. Let's say more. Let's say we wanted to get rid of the R, you could select that black X on it. Or you want to get rid of the entire text, select the element, hit delete. When you're deleting, you can choose it on in your project view over here, or you can select um, the element on the screen. You can, if you select the text, then that black X and hit delete, that'll delete it there. Or you can, of course, go into this and change it to different text by double clicking into the property box. Okay. Right. So we did that. How do you use images? Um, there's a few ways. I don't do this a whole lot personally, but I'll show you one way. Let's say I have this file and I want to create, I'm going to take this and I'm going to create an applique in the shape of a heart. So I'm just going to quick do it by holding the shift key and clicking on the applique tool. And that puts that green thing there. Well, I can go into the properties of that. And instead of a solid color, I can say graphic. And then I can go choose a graphic. These are in the fabric folder in Melco uh, under where the software is installed. So you can put your graphic there. I'll say, I usually just do it in Illustrator, which of course I closed, but we'll quick do it, or no, in Photoshop. So what I usually do is just save it off as a JPEG right here. So for instance, I'll save this off as a JPEG, which is already done. And then I'll open it and do a clipping mask of my digital file there, of whatever the picture of the fabric is that I want. So if I go over to Photoshop, whenever it decides to open up, I'll show you how that's done. All right. How do you design a font, especially a running or bean stitch font? Um, well, if you're talking about how you create, like create the stitches, that's part, you do that through the digitizing tools, right? Um, all right. So here, I already have it done. So I'm going to open it. All right, so let's say that's what you want to create. So I usually take this, select that, create a new layer. Once I have a new layer, I paint it in the shape. I'm just, cre I'm recreating what I already did. So I go paint. So now I've got a black circle or black heart there. And then I take my fabric, whatever fabric I have, the picture of it, drop it in and then say create clipping mask to that layer I got just created. So that's how I do it personally. It works really well. All right, so that's that one. So how do you design a font? Um, most of the time I believe they use Illustrator or things like that to draw it out using vectors. Um, to create the font that you want. So let's say you're going to duplicate your handwriting. You draw it out and then you'd bring it in and digitize it. So digitizing it within Design Shop, I always like or suggest doing it in one file first. So do your whole alphabet, any special characters you want. Um, you do them all out here. And once you're done, you can go and put them into the alphabet editor. All right. Now that you're, you go into the editor, you create new, and then through all these, you go and paste each character in, get it all set up right. All right. Uh, it's not a fast process. It works, but it, it's, you know, it, digitizing fonts takes a lot of work because you have to digitize 
you know, 26 characters, capital, lower numbers, special characters. It's a little, it's a big effort to digitize fonts. Um, fun, but takes a while. All right, just because the sheer volume of things you have to digitize individually. But you put them together in this OFA file, so this will create it for you. Now there was another question of how do I get rid of, you know, I have an I here. So I got this letter and I'm going to change it to a font that has that. I don't want this line there. I want it gone all the time. I'd rather deal with the trim than have that line there. So how do I get rid of it? How do I modify the font? Well, the fonts are saved under C program files, Melco, design shop, alphabets. So you take the font you have. Um, I took it already, copied it and pasted it over into testing. So you'd find your font. The micro block is the one I pulled up. So I copied that here, pasted it, and then I renamed it testing. So I've already done that. So I literally just copied that, pasted, called it testing. So now I'm going to go to my alphabet editor, tools, alphabet editor, change to my testing one. Oh, I'm in another one already. It doesn't like this. All right. So window, tools, alphabet editor, testing. Hm. That's magic. All right, I gotta reopen it. Close some of this stuff. <sighs> All right, so that's the question I'm attempting to address at the moment. There we go. Sorry about that. So, tools, alphabet editor, testing. Go down to my eye and zoom in on it. Here's all the steps of how it's digitized. So look at how it was digitized. They did a running stitch, kind of like a manual run. So maybe you don't want that. So maybe we delete that. I'm not saying this is the right way. I'm just saying this is a way you can do it. <laughs> so I got two columns now. I can put a trim in there. But maybe I want to put the underlay back. So why don't I do manual something or other there. Okay, I'm going to put that before there, then I have a trim, and then for this guy, maybe I go put that back, put that in front of there, oops, yeah, that'll work, and I can move the start over there. Okay, so I can re-digitize it, and keep in mind it's auto-saving as I go, all right? So now, if I use the testing font, it'll run like this now rather than with that um, manual underlay with the line that's actually sewn in. Okay, so you would just go edit your fonts. I always suggest copying and pasting it so you're not overwriting the original or save the original somewhere else. So if you don't like it, you can go back. Um, but that's how you do it. All right, what else do we have? Group names, I'm having trouble with it closing when I hit apply. Hmm. No. All right, so I had some group name files that I saved off. Hmm. Ones that I had already typed in names. Okay. So the setup for them is you type in whatever text, you come over to group names and enable it. When you add names, um, you type them in here. You can also import them and then you move them over onto this side and that's what's actually going to be selected. Down here is where you set how it's going to sew out, design, name, repeat. That's how I, I usually run it. And when you save it, now we have that in there. If I save off the EXP, you'll actually see the design, the name, and then another design, another name, and so on. So if I come over here and just, I'll save it off so you can see it. EXP, save, yes. Okay, so I'm gonna go open. 
So notice it's a whole bunch of stuff stacked on top of each other. Um, that's how these run, right? So it'll sew one design a name. You could put a hold. You pull the hoop off, put the new hoop on with your next garment, hit start. It'll sew the design, the next name. When it hits the hold, you pop it off, put the next one on, and just keep going through it. So it literally is repeating one name. And when you're programming this on the machine, you would do five colors and then a hold or an applique stop, whichever you prefer. And you'd hit apply OK. So when it sews those first five colors, it stops, waits for you to pop that hoop off, put the next hoop on. And so now you've got a blank garment. So then it's going to sew these stitches. Again, it's going to hit a hold again. So you don't have to program in 25 color changes. You program in the first five since the repeat once it hits that hold or it runs out of colors in the color change sequence, it's going to go back to the top. All right. Um, any, that's all I have. Apologize for the technical issues today. Um, we will be back next week sending your questions. We'll get these posted as soon as we can and hopefully um, get got at least a few questions answered for you. So we'll get it um, on next week again and... Hopefully the systems will decide to cooperate. All right. You guys have a great day and be sure to send in your questions, applications at melco.com or type them into the screen and we'll get them answered for you. All right. Till next time.